All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our Cambridge Astronomy Tuesday sessions for today. Um, my name is Haley, and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Cambridge. Uh, I mo mainly work in cosmology, but today I will be taking you through a really exciting battle between two really famous guys called Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. Both of these guys are mostly famous for giving us their own description of how gravity works. So before I get into the good stuff, um, I just want to remind you all that if you're enjoying the talks that we've been giving you every Tuesday, please do subscribe to the channel. We've got loads of other um, exciting stuff going on that we really think you'll find exciting, uh, including some at-home art, art and craft videos and also an astronomy book club coming up. So do get involved with that um, if you're interested. So this is an interactive talk. So do log in using Slido um, with, the, with the tag gravity to ask your fabulous questions. I've already got so many coming through. Um, and also to be able to answer the questions that I'll be asking you throughout the talk. All right, so just a note as well, there have already been so many good questions coming through so far. Um, and I've been told that we do get a lot of questions through the talk as well. So it might be a little bit tricky for me to keep up with all of your questions. So the reason for that is because we do need to approve them before they can come through on Slido. Just to make sure we keep any bad words out. And so sometimes I don't quite get around to them all. So I just want to let you know that if your question is sitting there pending approval for a while, it's nothing wrong with your question at all. And I will just try my best to, to actually get to it. Okay, so let's dive right into it now. So I said that Newton and Einstein both gave us descriptions for gravity. The main question that we're going to start with is what is gravity? And this is really what we're going to be talking about over the next half an hour or so. But first, let's begin with how we experience gravity here on Earth. So here, the blue circle is the Earth. So this little red bit at the middle is exactly that. It's the middle of the Earth. And I've made it red because it's quite hot in there. It's not really a nice place to be. So we all live and walk on the surface of the Earth. And what you might have or what you might not have thought about before is why don't we all just float off into space? What is actually keeping us here on Earth? This is gravity. So basically, this keeps us on the, on the surface of the Earth by pulling, and do note the quotation marks there, that will be important later, towards the center of the Earth. So this holds us on the surface and it also keeps the atmosphere around the surface of the Earth so that we can breathe too, which is nice. So this not only holds us on the surface of the Earth, but it keeps everything else down too. So that when you throw a ball into the air, that ball falls back towards the Earth rather than floating away into space because gravity brings it back down. So, as I said, each of these guys here have a different description for why this actually happens, for why things get pulled back towards the Earth. And more importantly, where gravity comes from and what it actually is. So the first question I have for you guys is really just something that I want to get a gauge of what you guys think before I go through and explain, um, explain to you in this talk. So this question that I have for you is who has the best theory of gravity? So I want you guys to go ahead and tell me just what you think, just based on your gut or based on what you know from what you've been told, what you've read or what you might have seen on TV. Um, let me know who you think has the best theory. So we can see we've already got some, got some questions, got some answers coming through, which is great. And I've already got a lot of questions from you guys coming through. So I am going to just jump over for a few minutes and try and accept some of these through that I, so that I can answer them in a little bit. All 
All right, this is great. So we've just got, over, got just over 200 responses. So keep them coming in. I really, really, really want to know what you guys think. I want to know who you think has the best theory. I'm just going to go through and accept a few more of these questions because there's so many and we've still got so many answers ticking through. Wow, there's so many great questions in here, guys. Keep them coming and keep those answers coming through. Let's try and get to 300 or even a bit more maybe. All right, so we've just ticked over 300. So now what we're going to do is we're going to see what you guys think of this. Wow, this is really interesting. Okay, so we've got 52% of you think Einstein has the best theory and 48% of you think that Newton actually has the best theory and that's changing right now as more and more of you vote. So this is really interesting. I'm, I'm not actually going to tell you the answer right now. So you're going to have to stick around to the end of the talk to see to see who actually comes out and has the best theory of gravity. All right, so let's, let's, let's carry along. Okay, so Newton gave us his theory of gravity a really, really long time ago. So we got this in a book called Principia, which is a really, really famous book, which was published in 1687. So that's over 330 years ago. So Einstein's theory came a little bit later in 1915, so just over 100 years ago. So you might have guessed by now, and um, especially based on these dates, this is not actually a real battle because these guys lived at such different times. They didn't actually live at the same time. So it is a battle of the brains or a battle of the theories. So we're going to start with Newton's theory because he was first. So one thing you'll notice here is that the picture of um, Newton on the left is actually a painting, whereas we have a photo of Einstein on the right hand side. And the truth is that we're not really sure what Newton really looked like. So if you go ahead and Google Isaac Newton, you'll come up with a bunch of different paintings and they all look like completely different people. And the reason for this is that there were no cameras back when Newton lived. So each portrait of him was done by a different person and so they had different painting abilities and they all looked very different. So I'm going to go with the, the picture of Newton that is probably the most famous, which is the one I just showed before. So Newton actually studied right here in Cambridge and he gave us the first ever description of why we don't all fly off the earth into space. And he did do a lot of other stuff too, but this is what he's mostly known for. He was really, really good at maths and his maths described the motion and behavior of the planets in our solar system. And using these, he helped prove Kepler's laws of planetary motion, which told us how the planets move in our solar system, and the motion of comets too, as they passed through. And he also helped us describe how tides work, because we get high tide and low tide at the beach because of the gravitational pull of the moon, which was des described by Newton's theory. And another thing he helped to prove, which was a really, really important revolution in astronomy, was that his theory helped to prove heliocentrism over geocentrism. So when I say that, you might be thinking, huh? And if your face looks like any of these right now, never fear, because I will explain what I mean by these long, scary words. So let's break it down. First of all, centrism means at the center. Geo means Earth. So think of like geology or geography. And helio means the sun, which comes from the ancient, ancient Greek Helios, who was the god of the sun. So here, geocentrism means earth at the center, and heliocentrism means sun at the center. And here, we're talking about the center of the solar system. So here is a picture of what this looks like. So on the left is geocentrism, so you can see we've got the earth at the center, and all the planets and the sun around it. On the right hand side, we've got the sun at the center and all of the planets around it there too. So the right hand side is what we're used to and hopefully is what you've been taught at school. But believe it or not, back when Newton was alive, a lot of people thought that actually the left hand side was right and that the earth was at the center of the solar system. Not only that, a lot of people also thought that the earth was at the center of the whole universe. 
So this was the accepted belief for a very long time until a guy called Nicholas Copernicus came along, this guy in the corner, and he suggested that actually we're really not that special and it's really the sun that's in the middle. And everyone hated this idea and it actually took a really long time until people believed him. But actually, if you take a look at the orbital paths of the planets um, that they have to take in each model to explain the motion that we can see in the sky with our telescopes, on the left-hand side, if we have the Earth sitting in the middle, completely stationary, all of the planets and the sun have to take these wild and crazy looping orbits to explain the motion that we can actually see here on Earth. And on the right-hand side, the heliocentric model, so the sun at the center, has very simple circles around the sun. So from this, it's pretty clear which one is more likely. And if you haven't guessed or didn't already know, heliocentrism is the way to go. And Newton's theory of gravity really helped to prove Copernic Copernicus's model and helped to convince people that this was the correct model of our solar system. And so the way that Newton actually came up with, with his theory um, of gravity is a pretty famous story, which you might have heard about already. So I want to ask you guys another question right now. And that question is, how did Newton first start thinking about gravity? So go ahead and vote on this one because I want to hear what you guys think or what you might have heard. Did someone throw a ball at him? Did an apple fall from a tree? Did he see a squirrel jump out of a tree? Or did he fall over? So there's a famous story for the way that Newton first, well not first experienced gravity, but the experience of gravity that he had that made him start thinking about how gravitational interactions work. So we've got a lot of votes coming through, so keep them coming. I want to know what you guys already know or what you think. And again, while you're doing that, I'm going to go over and I'm going to have a look at some of your awesome questions and let some of them through. So again, don't worry if the question that you've asked says it's awaiting approval. It's just because I've got so many here. I've got a lot of people saying how much they love this show and they've subscribed. So thanks so much. So please do subscribe to the channel if you're, um, if you're enjoying the, the talks that we're giving and you want to stay tuned for the other stuff that we have planned as well. Okay. Wow, okay, so we've got nearly 350, so keep them ticking up. Let's see if we can go for 400 on this one. So, all right, I'm just clicking through a few more of your awesome questions. Awesome, so we're getting up to 360. This is great, I can't wait to see what you guys think. Oh my God, there's so many great questions here as well. Great, so we're getting up to 380. Come on guys, we're nearly there. Let's get to 400. Let's vote, see what we can, how Newton first start thought, thinking about gravity. Oh my God, there's so many fun questions. I can't wait to go through all these guys with you. All right. All right, so we're gonna try and push it a little bit further or I might just have to end it there. We got really, really close to 400, so let's try and get that on the next question. All right, so how did Newton first start thinking about gravity? Woohoo, look at you guys go. All right, so we've got a huge 94% of you guys think that an apple fell from a tree, and a few of you think he might have fallen over, taken a bit of a tumble. Uh, a couple of you think he might have got hit by a ball. All of, the, all of these things might have also happened to Newton, let's just say. But the, the really, really famous story, which I'm sure you all know, and we're just gonna fit, hit 400 before I hit stop it, so that's great. Okay, so let's, let's get back to it. That's fabulous, guys, thanks so much. All right, so there are a few different stories for how this actually happened, but yes, it was the apple fell from a tree. So this story here that I've chosen to show you guys is one from a friend of Newton's called William which the story is in William's memoir of Newton, which was written in 1752. So the story is that William and Newton were sitting together in the garden near an apple tree. Newton saw the apple fall from the tree nearby, and this is what he said. Why should that apple always descend perpendicularly to the ground? Why should it not go sideways or upwards, but constantly to the earth's center? The reason is that the earth draws it. There must be a drawing power in matter. 
and the sum of the drawing power in the matter of the earth must be in the earth's centre, not in any side of the earth. Therefore, does this apple fall perpendicularly or towards the centre? So this is pretty amazing. So this is the thought which led him to formulating his full theory of gravity. And this came purely from Newton seeing something in nature and asking why. So this is a really common trait of most astronomers and physicists, and it's called curiosity. And because of Newton's curiosity, he gave us one of the most important theories in physics. So do remember to stay curious, and maybe you guys will make a big contribution one day. So what he told us is that gravity is a force. It's a force that pulls any and all two things that have mass together. So this could be you and the Earth, or a ball and the Earth, or a pig and a duck. And how strong this force is depends on how far things are away from each other. So if they're closer, the force is stronger. And if they're further away, the force is weaker. So this works, more, um, this works for more than just pigs and ducks. It's also the reason that the Earth orbits the Sun. And it's why the Moon orbits the Earth. And it's why the solar system orbits around the galaxy. It's why galaxies look the way they do, and it's why galaxies crash together, and I could go on and on and on. So, overall, we might now be thinking that Newton's done pretty well. He had the only description for gravity for 200 years. But we may think he's won. But even Newton himself admitted that his theory was not complete. He knew that there was more. One of his burning questions was, where does the force come from? Why do objects with mass appear to pull each other together? He didn't understand where this invisible force came from or what was driving it. And some of our astronomical observations actually disagreed with some predictions from Newton's theory. Okay, so now we're going to move on to this happy guy, Albert Einstein. Very clever guy. So while Newton told us that gravity is the result of an invisible force, Einstein told us that gravity is a consequence of geometry. So this is the mathematics of lines, shapes, surfaces, and curves. And don't worry, I will explain how this relates a little bit more. Before I do that, let's talk about space. So we all know what we mean when we say space. It's the stuff in the sky that we can see at night. And if we look at pictures, like this one here taken by NASA, it's very empty. There's lots of stars and galaxies everywhere, but there's also lots of space. So what is it? What is the stuff that lies between all of the galaxies out there? So now it's time for another question for you guys, which I'm also really interested to see what you guys think. The question I have for you is what is space? So this is a really, really tricky question and some of the answers might seem a little bit silly, but let's just give it your best go. Because remember, this is a question that was only answered by arguably one of the most intelligent people ever, Albert Einstein. So do you guys think that space is really hot? Do you think it's nothing? It's just empty. Do you think it's like a big swimming pool? Or do you think it's like a giant trampoline? So as I said, these questions might seem a little bit silly. And I promise you they will make sense when I go ahead and explain a little bit more. But for now, I just want you guys to try and think a little bit intuitively about what you think might be between all of those galaxies out there. What is all of that empty space? So we've got a bunch of responses coming through. This is, this is fabulous. So I'm just going to go ahead and go back to the questions. And I'm going to keep flicking through and trying to get some of these through so we can answer them later on. God, there's so many great questions here, guys. All right, we nearly hit 300, 300 responses, so keep it going. Really, really curious to see what you guys think. Wow, so many great questions. All right, we're getting up there. Nearly 400 again. Let's try and hit that 400 one more time. 
All right, and one more time, please don't worry if your question says it is pending. It's just because we've got so, so many. I'm trying really, really hard to get all of these approved and get them through so that I can answer them later. These are great. All right, we've ticked over 400. Okay, this is great. I can't wait to see what you guys think. All right, let's have a look. What do you guys think space is? Nothing, it's just empty. Ooh, that's the winner. Oh, that's really interesting. And some of you think it's like a big swimming pool. And some of you think it's like a big, like a giant trampoline. And a few of you think it's really, really hot. So one thing I will just confirm with you guys is that space is actually really, really cold. So this was a little trickster question that I threw in there to try and try and trick you guys, which looks like I tricked some of you. So space is actually really, really cold. It's um, a f negative a few hundred degrees Celsius. So it's definitely very very cold out there all right so most of you most of you think that space is nothing and it's just empty so let's let's pop back and figure out what it actually is so einstein described space itself not galaxies but the empty space between them as a kind of fabric and that fabric can be bent and distorted and the way that that fabric is bent and distorted is described by the maths of geometry so now you might be thinking, whoa, this is getting pretty weird. I've got no idea what she's talking about. So a way that I like to understand this is to think of a giant trampoline. And you probably know what the answer to the previous question was now. So most of us have been on a trampoline or at least understand how a trampoline behaves. So a trampoline sitting there alone, like this picture, is flat. But when we step onto it, it bends. And the, the fact that we are standing on the trampoline bends the fabric of the trampoline. So imagine you sat down in the middle and there was an apple in the corner. This apple would roll towards you because you bent the surface of that trampoline. So this is a really good way to think about Einstein's gravity. So he describes space itself kind of like a trampoline. So anything with mass, like the sun in this picture, bends the fabric of space. And just like the apple, this bending changes the path of objects that move through that space. So the sun bends space around it, and this is why we move around the sun. Because, as you can see here, the path that the Earth takes is bent by the sun's mass. And you'll also notice that the little bit of space around the Earth in this picture is also bent a little bit, but much, much less than the sun, because the Earth weighs a lot less than the sun. So the amount that space is bent depends on how massive the object bending it is. So that tiny little dent you can see around the Earth is why we don't float off into space. So the Earth has its own dent, which means we are always kind of falling towards Earth, much like the apple rolling towards you on the trampoline. And this keeps us on the ground. So this was a totally new way to think about gravity. And it meant that we didn't need an invisible force that couldn't be explained anymore. Instead, geometry came to the rescue. So the maths of how surfaces are bent and distorted. And this gave us a much more intuitive way to think about gravity. And this told us where gravity comes from. So Einstein's theory is actually the same as Newton's theory or very similar to Newton's theory on small distances. So here on Earth, everything looks the same, whether you use Einstein's theory or Newton's theory, but only in certain circumstances do they start to differ from one another. So this is like when we looked at things that were really, really far away, or things that are moving really, really fast, or things that are really, really massive, like all of our favorite black holes. So Einstein's theory predicted a lot of things that Newton's gravity couldn't quite explain properly. And I'm going to tell you about a few of these specific examples right now. So the first one is to do with the orbit of Mercury. So this is the closest planet to the sun. So it's really nice and hot there. And not only Mercury itself is spinning around on its axis and it's moving on this elliptical orbit around the sun, but the orbit itself is also spinning. So over time, the place in Mercury's orbit where it is closest to the sun called the perihelion, which is this pink distance here, rotates around the sun. So this is called precession. So you might have heard of the precession of the perihelion of Mercury, and that's exactly what this effect is. 
So Newton told us that this was because the other planets were pulling on Mercury. And remember the pig and the duck? So not only does the pig pull on the duck, but the duck also pulls on the pig, if that makes sense. So the sun is pulling all of the planets into orbit around it, but all of the other planets are also pulling on each other and the sun. And because Mercury is so small and so close to the sun, it gets pulled a lot. But Newton made a prediction for this and it wasn't quite right. So Einstein says, this is true, but there's more. So because space is curved and Mercury is so close to the sun, it's pretty deep inside the sun's dent in space. So this gives an additional effect to do with this precession that couldn't be explained by Newton's theory alone. So the next thing is if we consider a distant star, we want to observe this star using our telescopes. So we collect the light that this star emits um, into the mirrors of our telescopes. If there is nothing between us and the star, except space, of course, so it's not just completely empty, then the light from the star travels in a straight line to reach us. Simple. So things get a little bit trickier if something's in the way. So say the sun. So right now I've got my last question for you guys, which what happens to the light of the, of the sun? What happens to the light if the sun is in the way? Sorry, I've got a bit of a typo in the question there. So basically I want you guys to tell me what happens to the light from the distant star if the sun is sitting in the way there. Does it go straight through the sun and hit our telescope anyway? Does it get bent around and still might get to our telescope? Does it take a sharp left hand turn at the sun and then keep going? Or does it turn around and go back to the star? So this is a question that you might need to think about a little bit more. So what we want to know is that if we've got a distant star and a sun, the sun sitting in between us and that star, what happens to that light? All right, while you guys are thinking about this, and I can see a lot of your um, answers coming in, so keep them coming, please. I really want to know what you guys think about this. I'm going to have an, a bit more of a look at some of your amazing questions. A lot of people want to know who I think has the best theory. So again, I'm not going to give away the answer, but I'll tell you guys at the end as well. This is great. All right, keep these answers coming through, guys. This is a bit of a trickier question. You've got to think about what's going to happen to this light ray as it passes by the sun or doesn't pass by the sun. Or does it just turn around and go back? It's like, uh-oh, there's a sun in the way. Better turn around. Oh, God, these questions are so good, guys. Please keep them coming. All right, we're going over 350 now, so let's keep that going. Awesome, we nearly hit 400. Let's go for the 400 mark again. Can't wait to see what you guys think about this. Loving how interactive you guys are getting and how many of you are getting involved in the questions. This is fabulous. All right, this is great. Let's have a look at what you guys think. Okay, all right, so 59% of you think that it gets bent around and still might get to our telescope. Some of you think it'll turn around and go back to the star, and a few of you think it might take a sharp left-hand turn or it might go straight through the sun and hit our telescope anyway. Thanks so much for answering this, guys. This is fabulous. All right, let's find out. So if the sun is in the way, because the sun bends the space around it, this means the path of the light also gets bent. So in this case, the light from the star goes around the sun, and in this case, it does still hit our telescope. So that's not always true. So this effect is called gravitational lensing. So this is because it's the gravitational field of the sun, which is acting like a kind of lens for the light from the star behind it. So when we observe the star, it looks like it's over here. 
And we can measure how this apparent position of a star changes as the star moves past the Sun. And both Newton and Einstein had a prediction for the numbers we would get out. So this effect was first observed during a solar eclipse in 1919. Because the Sun is pretty bright, so we normally can't see the stars that are right behind it, which I'm, I'm sure some of you are clever enough to have been thinking about already. So what we needed is for something to block out the Sun so that we could see these stars behind it and see how they were moving. So nowadays, we, we use this same effect to see galaxies that just happen to be lying behind even bigger galaxies or clusters of galaxies. And this can magnify the light of the galaxy in the background so that we can see even further than we normally could. And as I said, both Newton and Einstein had different predictions or different numbers for how we thought these stars would appear to be moving. Newton's theory did say that light would get bent, but differently to Einstein's theory. So Einstein for the win again. And the last thing I want to tell you about is something that's become very popular over the last few years. So these are gravitational waves, and I'm sure a lot of you have heard about what these are, um, especially because we heard Matt's great talk the other week about black holes. So since we're all expert, experts now and we know that space is like a fabric, a consequence of this is that waves can travel through this fabric. So kind of like how they travel through the surface of a pond. So if you throw a rock into a pond, you'll see these great circular ripples moving outwards from where you threw the rock in. And in this example with the pond, the rock is a disturbance to the surface of the pond. So in space, if we have two really massive objects that bend space a lot, like black holes, and we smash them together really violently, then this is a disturbance to the fabric of space. And just like the pond, when this happens, we get these ripples traveling out from the black holes in every direction. So that's what this picture here is showing. We've got two black holes in the middle, and they're getting really close to smashing together. So they're sending out these disturbances, so these, these circular-ish waves traveling in every single direction in the actual fabric of space. So this means that sometimes these ripples can reach us here on Earth if the black holes are close enough. And we detect them as tiny, and I mean tiny changes in length as the wave in space passes through us. So this is super interesting stuff and it's a whole talk in itself. And I've already seen a few questions about black holes and gravitational waves. So hopefully we'll get through to, asking, um, to answering those ones, but do ask more if you're interested. So Newton's theory doesn't allow for gravitational waves to exist at all, but Einstein's does. And so we actually did observe these gravitational waves for the first time recently, so that is yet another win for Einstein. And in fact, there's many more wins than these ones I've described to you now. So more than the precession of the perihelion of Mercury, which was um, predicted not quite right by Newton, but it was right by Einstein. And gravitational lensing, which again, Newton didn't quite get right, but Einstein's theory had a much better prediction. Gravitational waves, which were theorized for decades, a very, very long time, and a lot of people worked very, very hard to try and detect these things. Some people working their entire professional careers trying to detect gravitational waves. And many, many more things. And all of the predictions so far in Einstein's theory of um, gravity have been shown to be correct. So just to emphasize, Einstein published his theory in 1915. So it's a long time ago. And right now we have very precise observations from our telescopes and absolutely none of them have faulted Einstein's equations enough for us to think that it's not true. And gravitational waves were only observed for the first time about five years ago in 2015. So this to me is one of the most beautiful things in physics. The most, this, yeah, so this detection of gravitational waves, 100 years after he first published his theory, is just one of the most amazing things to me. So in the end, I think it's no contest really, and I think that Einstein has the best theory of gravity, and in terms of the, its ability to explain our natural universe and to explain the observations that we make, Einstein definitely wins. So I'm sorry to all of you who thought that Newton's theory was the best, but we'll still give him an honorable mention. 
because his theory is still used really, really widely today, over 300 years later, in many areas of astrophysics and cosmology, because it gives us a really good approximation to Einstein's theory. And it's much simpler and easier to use. So we'll give Newton a close second. Okay, so that's great. And I really, really hope that you guys have enjoyed that. So now I'm just going to jump over and we'll start going through some of these fantastic questions that you guys have. Awesome. Okay, so the first question that we have is from Lexi, age 10. Hi, Lexi. Thanks for your question. So the question is, how high from the ground until gravity stops affecting you? So this is a really, really tricky question because gravity, it doesn't just stop affecting you at a particular point. It's like a very, very gentle drop off into space. So we all know that astronauts, when they go to the International Space Station, they, they float inside the space station. So even where the astronauts are, they, there is not no gravity there. They still do have some gravity. It's just much, much weaker than it is on Earth, which is why they float. So Earth's gravity will still keep affecting us pretty far into space. And if we think about it, um, the reason that the moon orbits us is because of gravity. So the moon is even still being affected by Earth's gravity. But in terms of humans, when we go high enough into space that we, can, that we orbit the Earth, so like in our spacecraft, you could say that gravity stops affecting us because uh, its, a, its effect has gotten less such that we then start to float. So we're not kept down on the ground anymore. So that's a really great, great question, Lexi. Thanks so much. All right. So the next one we've got is from Henry B, age eight. Hi, Henry. Thanks for your question. So if you could travel faster than the speed of light, would doing so take you back in time? Wow. What a great question. And this is such a tricky one to answer. So this is to do with Einstein's theory of special relativity, which was the first theory that he, um, that he developed. He developed it before his theory for gravity. So if you, we know that in physics um, you can't travel faster than the speed of light, but if you could, this is a really interesting thought experiment. So as, you, as your speed approaches the speed of light, some weird stuff starts to happen to time. So if you were sitting in a spaceship and you accelerated that spaceship to the speed of light, time would slow down. So time would tick slower. And when you reach the speed of light, time would stop. So I don't really know the answer to this question, but what I would guess is that if you kept going and were somehow able to push your spaceship to go faster than the speed of light, your time would start ticking backward. Now, this is tricky because that's not exactly the same as going back in time. So all that means is that your watch that you were wearing would start tick ticking backwards. But that doesn't actually mean that you're traveling back in time to go and give Newton a high five back in the 1700s. And the reason for that is um, pretty complicated and it's to do with special relativity. And the reason for it is that it's only in your frame that time would be ticking at that speed. So this is a really tricky concept. So basically it in special relativity, it depends which frame you're in. So you wouldn't really be traveling back in time, but your local watch would be going backwards. And this, this is really tricky and it's a really, really good question. So thanks so much, Henry. Well, the next question is a very, very exciting one. And this is, this is something that I really love explaining. So thanks Henry again for asking this fantastic question. So the question is, how does the LIGO machine measure gravitational waves? Well, so the LIGO machine, so LIGO, in case anyone doesn't know, is the, um, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. So that's what the acronym LIGO stands for. And this is the collaboration of a whole lot of people around the world who were working for a very long time to try and detect gravitational waves. So they've got a few machines in, on either side of the US. And these machines are interferometers. So what that means is they've got two perpendicular arms. And these arms are four kilometers long. So you can kind of imagine like an L shape. So you've got their little, their little offices and then you've got two four kilometer long arms going out in each direction like a giant L. And 
what these arms are are giant vacuum tubes and what they do is they shoot light down these arms to a little mirror that's sitting at the end four kilometers away and so they're constantly bouncing light back and forward down each of these arms and what they use that light for because we know the speed of light very very well they use the bouncing of light to measure the distance in each of these arms so I said they're four kilometers but actually what happens is when a gravitational wave passes through, so when two black holes smash together really, really far away, as I said, that wave travels out in every direction in space. And eventually it will hit Earth. And the effect of that is a stretching and contracting of space in the two perpendicular directions, so up, down and left. So what these arms measure is a very, very, very tiny change in length of these two arms. And when I say a tiny change in length, I mean really, really tiny. So as I said, these arms are four kilometers and the change in length that they are measuring as a gravitational wave passes through is one thousandth the width of one of your hairs. So if right now, if you have a look at a single strand of your hair and divide that width by one thousand, that is the change in distance that the LIGO machine is measuring as a gravitational wave passes through. So it's really amazing technology and it's really, really precise that we have nowadays. So thanks so much for that question, Henry. I love it. And I really hope that made sense. All right, let's go to the next question. Is dark by Luca, age seven. Thanks, Luca. Is dark energy a similar force to gravity? This is a really, really tricky question. Really fabulous question. And I can tell you that it's the question on almost every single cosmologist's lips. So for those of you who don't know, dark energy is the name we've given to, to the thing that is driving the expansion rate of our universe to accelerate. So we measure, we measure distances in the universe and we know the universe is expanding, but not only is it expanding, but that expansion rate is accelerating. And basically we have no idea what's causing it. We've got some clues, but we really don't know what dark energy is or how it behaves. So this is a really interesting question. In the, the answer really is, I have no idea, personally, and neither does the larger cosmological community. But there are a lot of people who do think that dark energy is some kind of extension to Einstein's general relativity, or you can actually um, include dark energy inside Einstein's equations as they are. So this is something that Back in history, when Einstein first released his theory of GR, back then everyone thought the universe wasn't expanding. So he introduced, an, but his theory predicted that the universe would expand naturally. So what he did is he introduced an extra term into his equations to sort of stop that and to make the universe static because that's what everyone thought. But then it turned out that some observations showed us that the universe actually is expanding. So he got rid of this term being like, ah, don't need that anymore. But then what happened, then we found out that the expansion rate is actually accelerating. So now people have brought back in this term that Einstein used ages ago to explain dark energy. So it's a really good question, Luke, and I really, really wish I had more of an answer for you. Um, but do stay tuned and maybe you'll be able to figure it out one day. All right, so our next question is from Kabia, and thanks for the question. So this question is, did Einstein and other physicists before their creations Wow, that's a really good question. So I'm not sure about Newton, to be honest. As far as I know, um, his theory was the first theory of gravity. So I don't think he really stole it from anyone. Einstein didn't steal ideas either. But remember when I was telling you about Newton's theory and he, he wasn't quite satisfied with it. So he had this great description for gravitational interactions, but he, was, he didn't understand where where they came from or what they really were, what was, what was causing them. So Einstein used Newton's laws of motion to build on it and to improve it. And his main motivation for this was because Newton's laws didn't work with Max Maxwell's um, equations of electromagnetism. So this was how he made special relativity, was trying to make these two things work together. And then from special relativity, he then generalized it into his theory of gravity, which is general relativity. So I wouldn't use the word steal, but I would definitely say that Einstein built on Newton's original ideas to develop his theory. Thanks so much for the question. All right, let's pop to the next one. 
from Henry B again. You had so many great questions. If we manage to measure gravitational waves, does that mean Einstein wins the battle? So hopefully I've already answered this, but we have measured gravitational waves. So this was the latest win in 2015. And now we know that gravitational waves do actually exist. So this is pretty hard evidence that Einstein wins the battle because Newton said they didn't exist at all. So thanks a lot for that question. I'll pop on to the next one. What happens if two black holes merge? A fabulous question from Chives. Thank you, Chives. So again, this is to do with the gravitational waves. So in general, if we have two black holes, which are going to be pulled together because of gravity, then when those black holes merge, they basically just form a bigger black hole. And they, in the process, they spit out a bunch of gravitational waves, which hopefully we can measure at our telescopes. And then from the way that that wave looks, we can figure out some things about uh, or how far apart they were before they merged or what they came from or a bunch of really interesting stuff. So thanks a lot for that one, Chives. So another question from Anonymous, a bit of a fun one. Who, in your opinion, would win in a lightsaber battle? So that's tricky because obviously Newton and Einstein lived 200 years apart. Um, so I... Look, I would personally say Einstein just because I really, really, I've, I think Einstein is much better and I think he has a fabulous theory of gravity that is just completely flawless. So I think that's all you really need to win a lightsaber battle. So thank you very much, Anonymous. All right, another question by Zach and Sam, age nine. Hey, Zach and Sam, thanks so much for your question. How does gravity change under the sea? Wow, this is really, really interesting. So... Under the sea, I mean, I guess, so the reason that we float gravity, that's to do with the buoyancy of the oceans. That's a whole another topic that is definitely not my expertise. But we still have the same amount of gravity pulling us down. It's just that when we're in the sea, we then have two forces. So we have gravity pulling us toward the center of the earth from the ocean, pushing us upwards. So I guess if you, if you weigh enough to... Um, to overcome the buoyancy, you will start to drift towards the bottom of the sea. But if you don't weigh enough, you will stay at the top. So this is why divers wear weight belts, for example, so they can overcome the buoyancy by increasing their weight so that the force of gravity is stronger and it pulls them down towards the earth. So gravity itself would stay this, exactly the same under the sea because all it cares about is how massive the thing pulling us is, which is the earth in our case how far away from the center we are and our mass so how much you weigh so i guess the only thing is if you went to a really 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 deep part of the ocean so one of those part the deepest parts which are a few kilometers deep then if you went right down the bottom there you would have a lot of other problems just for starters but the gravity would be a little bit stronger than it was at the earth if you went two kilometers below sea level, but that's really all that would change about gravity. But as I said, there are other forces at play there as well. Thanks so much, Zach and Sam. Great question. All right, so our next one is from Cats, five and eight. Thanks so much, Cats. So how did people work out how strong gravity is? This is a really, really great question. So, oh, we've swapped over there, but I'll just keep ask, answering Cats question first. How do people work out how strong gravity is? So how do people measure how strong the force is, I guess? So on Earth, this is, we can measure, measure the acceleration that objects feel as they fall towards Earth. So on Earth, the strength of gravity is on average 9.8 meters per second per second. Now those are some weird units, so I'll just explain what that means. So imagine that you're in an aeroplane, thing falls out of the aeroplane, which is horrible, of course, but that thing will start falling towards the earth. And for every second, the speed of that object will increase by 9.8 meters per second. So that's really, really fast. So if something is falling for five seconds, it will be falling at about 50 meters per second. So as you keep falling for longer, you get pulled more and more towards the earth. So there's a lot of experiments that we can do right here on Earth that helped us figure out how strong the gravity of the Earth is. 
and we can also figure out so the strength of gravity depends on how massive something is so if you have a really a really massive black hole or the, the sun for example has a much stronger gravitational pull than the earth so that means that that gravitational pull goes out much further and the sun can hold on to objects like Pluto which is really really far away whereas the the earth only hold, really holds on to the moon which isn't it isn't anywhere near as far away. So a lot of like lo local experiments that people did on Earth to figure out how strong gravity is. And I'm sure there are a lot of them that you can do at home as well if you want to look it up. Thanks so much, cats. Fabulous. Okay, the first one now from Anonymous is what would happen if the moon was not there? That's a really interesting question. And so if the moon were to just disappear... I'm going to assume that's what you mean. So if the moon wasn't there at all, then we would probably have, if it wasn't there at all to start with, we would probably have a bunch of our own problems because the, Earth, the, moon, the moon's pull on the Earth has a lot of important, um, important consequences for life on Earth. But if the moon was there to start with and it just disappeared, small effect. So as I said, everything with mass pulls on everything else because of gravity. So the Earth pulls on the moon, but the moon also pulls on the Earth. So it... We all know that the reason we have tides is because of the moon. So the moon pulls the surface of the earth towards it, which distorts the water surface, which kind of makes it bulge out around the earth. And this is why it pulls the tides in and pushes the tides out as, as the moon moves around us. So if we didn't have a moon, our tides would be very different because there is also a contribution to the tides from the sun. So we would still have some kind of tides if the moon was not there but they wouldn't be as strong as they are and there's probably a lot of other things but I can't think of anything else right now so I hope that's enough anonymous thank you so much our next one is from S Robinson age nine thank you so much for your question can plants survive in no gravity wow that is fantastic and I am by no means a botanist I I don't know to be honest, can they su survive in no gravity? So I think they, they grow some plants on the space station, I think. Um, they're, they're, but there is some gravity on the space station. So it's a really, really tricky question. And there might be an answer to it, but I'm really sorry, but I really don't know. All right. So the next one by Anonymous is why don't we get crushed by gravity? Again, fabulous question. So we don't get crushed because the gravity is just not that strong. If we were to go and stand on the surface of something called a neutron star, which for those of you who don't know, is basically just a really, really, really dense star. So dense that a teaspoon of what the neutron star is made of would weigh a couple of tons. So this is incredibly dense. And on, so in that case, our bones would be nowhere near strong enough and we would probably be crushed to smithereens. But on Earth, luckily, the gravity is just right. So it's just enough for us to be able to walk around without getting crushed. And, but it's, it's not too much so that we can still jump around. We can still jump on trampolines. We can still make planes fly and send rockets into space and all of these kind of things. Um, so if the gravitational field were a lot stronger, we would get crushed. But I also don't think that if the gravity was that strong, we would have evolved on Earth at all. So it's because it's just right that we were able to to live here on earth fabulous question all right next one by callisto age 10 hi callisto thanks for your question whose scientific discoveries were more important newton or einstein wow this is really tricky were more important so for me and again this is because i am definitely on the einstein side personally I would say that Einstein's were more important. And the reason for this is because the predictions from Einstein's theory of gravity um, match our observations much, much better. So what this means is that we can learn a lot more about the universe and how it works. So Newton's theory is, it was absolutely fabulous for the 1600s and we still use it so much today, which is really saying a lot about how important that discovery was. And of course, I'd, Einstein did build his theory on Newton's original discovery. So, so there you go. Who really knows? But in terms of what we've been able to learn about the universe from Einstein's theory, we've really been able to learn 
so much more using Einstein's gravity than Newtonian gravity. So I would definitely say that Einstein's were more important. Thanks, Callisto. Next question by Eva Marie. Does gravity have mass? Oh, that's a very, very philosophical question. So this is, this is, this is tricky. So gravity itself does not have mass. No. So mass is something that, that you have. It's something that the earth has. It's something that pigs have and ducks have and the sun has. And this mass induces gravity. So the way that this mass curves the space time around us, this is where gravity comes from. So gravity itself does not have mass, but mass causes gravity. So hopefully that makes sense, Eva. Thanks for your question. Why is gravity on Earth but not in space? Question from Isla, age nine, and Theo, age five. Thank you, Isla and Theo. What a fabulous question. So the reason that we feel gravity on Earth is because we are so close to the center of the Earth. So as I said before, the strength of gravity depends on how massive the thing is that's pulling you, and it depends on how far away you are from that thing. So when we go into space, we're just further away from further away from things that have mass, which means that there is less gravity. So it's also tricky to say that there is no gravity in space because this is, I don't think this, this is not quite true. So because there are so many things everywhere, there are so many galaxies and there are so many stars and so many planets, all of these things are constantly pulling and tugging on each other, right? Or bending the fabric of space, should I say, that's more accurate. Um, so there really is gravity every, everywhere. What varies is just the strength of this gravity. So the strength of gravity on Earth is just stronger because we're really close to the Earth. But as soon as you go far away from anything, so if you're sitting out in space in the middle of nowhere um, with no galaxies or stars or planets around, there still would be a little bit of gravity. It would just be really, really weak because everything's so far away from you. So thank you so much, Isla and Theo. All right. So Herbie, would going at warp speed take you back in time? So I think I already answered this question before. It wouldn't quite make you go back in time. It would just make your watch tick backwards. So thanks so much, Herbie. I hope you um, heard the answer that I, that I said before. Okay, Alex H, another question. How far does the sun's gravity reach to? Wow, okay, that's really, really tricky. And again, and I really hope that you've, that you've got something out of the questions I've already answered. So the sun's gravity basically almost goes on forever. It just decays off very slowly as you get further and further away from the sun. So Pluto is really, really far away and it is still held in place by the sun. But there's a reason that the solar system ends. So this is because you get to a point away from the sun that the gravity is not really strong enough to keep anything in anymore. So, so there isn't really a concrete answer to this question. Um, but hopefully that, that helps you to understand, Alex. Thanks for your question. So we've ticked over to four, but I think I'm going to answer a few more of these just because they're so good. Oh, I love this one. This is a great question. Oswin and Edmund. Thank you so much, guys. So are scientists currently planning experiments to challenge Einstein's theory of general relativity? This is fabulous. It's really, really great. And this really shows that you guys have that curiosity that I mentioned is so important before. So yes, Einstein's theory does match our observations really, really well, but there are still a lot of things that we don't understand. So there are a lot of scientists out there working to test and push Einstein's theory to the limits. And as I said before, everything we've thrown at it so far has not failed, but yes, there are lots and lots of tests going on. So one of these is gravitational waves. So one prediction of Einstein's theory is that the speed of gravitational waves is the same as the speed of light. So this is something that we can measure when not, not when two black holes merge, but when we have two neutron stars merge, which are some of the more recent detections. of that. So when two neutron stars merge, there's a big flash of light that goes with the merger. So what we get is a giant flash and some gravitational waves because these objects are also very dense and being smashed together. So this means that it's a race between the light and the gravitational waves to reach us here on Earth. So we set our stopwatch and we can time how long it takes the gravitational waves to get here. And we can time how long it takes the light to get here. 
And basically what we found is that they arrive at exactly the same time. So Einstein wins at that one. But this is again something that we're going to continue testing as we get more and more precision in our measurements. And also, so as I mentioned briefly before with a question about dark energy, so dark energy and dark matter, really, really complicated stuff. And there's a lot of people who think that the reason that dark energy and dark matter exist is because Einstein's theory is not quite right. So there are a lot, when I say a lot, I mean a lot of different extensions to Einstein's gravity that people are experimenting with to try and explain things like dark matter and dark energy. And also, of course, there's a bunch of new telescopes around at the moment that are looking straight into the center of our galaxy at our host supermassive black hole, Sagittarius A star. And what this is, this is really exciting because this is a, the new telescopes are looking really, really close at this black hole. And this will give us a really up close and personal laboratory to test GR by looking straight at this black hole. So there are a lot of experiments at, going on at the moment to test Einstein's theory. For sure. Thanks so much for asking. Our next question by Josh. So I think this might have to be our last question. Sorry, guys. So thanks so much for asking, Josh. Why does gravity not pull you to the center of the Earth? It does. So it does pull us towards the center of the Earth. But I think what you might be asking is why doesn't it pull us through into the center of the Earth? I'm going to assume that's what you're asking. So the, again, the reason for that is similar to the, to the question of why we don't get crushed. And this is just because the gravity is not quite strong enough. And also the, the, the surface of the Earth is quite tough as well. So the gravity is not strong enough to pull us all the way through. All right, so thank you so much, guys. This has been so much fun. I've loved seeing all your answers to my questions and answering all of your fabulous questions. I really, really hope that they helped. Um, so please, please do uh, follow our channel and look out for more of these talks every single Tuesday afternoon. And um, like and subscribe and look out for all of the other fun stuff that we have um, going on. And some fun book clubs over holidays and things like that. So thank you so much, guys, and see you all next week.